Good evening and welcome to the Shrewsbury Historical Society. This is our September 2021 presentation. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. We have a wonderful program, but before that begins, let's go over the society's business. First, we need to cover our curator's report. Christine Gustafson will fill in for Linda Davis. Thank you. I'm Chris Gustafson, Vice President. Curator Linda Davis reports that recent donations include an antique glass front cabinet, items from Raystone Post, as well as clippings and photos of the hurricane of 1938. Linda also provided information for award-winning author Nathaniel Philbrick. His book, Travels with George, chronicles the 1789 inaugural tour of George Washington through the States. Philbrick personally retraced the journey in 2018, and we're proud to say that Shrewsbury is included in chapter six. Thank you very much. Next is our treasurer's report, Jeffrey Undercoffler. Thank you, Eric. Uh, my name is Jeffrey Undercoffler. I'm the treasurer of the Shrewsbury Historical Society. And first, I would like to give a special thanks to my predecessor, Anne Froland, for all the work that she provided for the society as the former treasurer of the, the Historical Society. On behalf of the board of directors, I would like to thank everyone for renewing their membership. We are grateful for the donations given by our members and the friends of society who help us continue to our outreach to the community. Our finances are, are in good order. Our bills have been paid. The majority of our expenses are incurred for the upkeep of our two properties that are under our care, the 1830 schoolhouse and the number five schoolhouse. This includes general maintenance, landscaping, the alarm systems, and the winter plowings uh, to gain access to the building. We also have heat, utilities, and water, phone, and the internet service available at the 1830 schoolhouse. When traveling through the Shrewsbury Center um, on your next trip, I would encourage everyone to look up at the 1830 schoolhouse. The society replaced the 1830 school sign on the gable end of the um, 1830 schoolhouse facing the common. I would also like to encourage our members that have not yet seen in their membership to visit the Shrewsbury Historical Society website to download uh, a renewal or a new membership form. Members that are current will receive uh, relative newsletters and updates on all upcoming programs. Thank you and I'm looking forward to our meetings and guest speakers scheduled for this fall. Thank you very much, Jeffrey. In other business, we have two items to share. Number one, our new 1830 sign is up after the summer installation on the society building. You'll see it in the front of the building. It's black with gold letters, 1830, the year the building was uh, uh, started. The 20th anniversary of 911 was on Saturday in front of our building and the fire department. The sign looked great, many people noticed. The other uh, item is the 13th annual Shrewsbury History Week. We have programs put out by the Shrewsbury Media Connection. The programs are listed out by different times that they're playing. The list is through Sue Thalzoy. Tonight, our program is Traditional New England Cider Making, History and Techniques by Dennis Picard. Virtual program taped and rebroadcast. Shrewsbury channels 28 and 328 are available on deadline. About the presentation. What today is understood by apple cider is not the same cider during the 18th and 19th century. Cider was considered the normal drink in New England to be consumed at every meal. The basic method of making cider is relatively simple and because it is, so much can go wrong. Learn about the mills, machinery and products of New England cider making tradition. About the presenter. Mr. Picard began his career in 1978 at Old Sturbridge Village and has been a museum professional in the living history field for over 40 years. He has authored many articles on lifestyles and folkways of New England and served as a consultant for many historical societies and museums. Mr. Dennis Picard. Thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate being, uh, being back even if it's uh, virtually <laughs> Uh, to, to Shrewsbury. It's a wonderful community and, and certainly the, 
the schoolhouse is a, is a treasure. Let me start by uh, sharing my screen. I'd like to begin with a quote that'll explain where this uh, title came from. It's actually from uh, a diary uh, of the Searles family from 1809. Uh, and it was uh, something recorded by uh, George Searles, uh, one of the sons of the family. He said, we made about six and 20 barrels of cider. We can drink if dry and give a poor traveler a mug if we please. So a drink when we want it and a cup for a thirsty traveler. Traditional New England cider making history and techniques. Um, we do have to establish from the very beginning, as was pointed out in the introduction, that when I say cider and when folks historically said cider, what they meant was something that was between four and 8% alcohol. It would be equivalent uh, to uh, many beers today. Uh, we are about the only place in the world that uses the term cider to refer to something that is not alcoholic. Uh, if you look very close, closely at the packaging of uh, cider today that we buy today, it'll always say sweet cider or uh, cider from, from the press or some way to, to, to distinguish it from the real uh, historic term of, of, of cider. Um, it also is something, just, just a personal little bugaboo with me, when people talk about hard cider, that's like saying alcoholic wine. Why do you have to say that? If you say wine, you automatically know that you're talking about something that has been fermented. And historically, uh, up until really the, the 20th century, anytime the, the term was used in the United States, it was always referring to something that was fermented. And we're going to learn a little bit about that tonight. Um, first of all, the orchard and the fruit. Um, this program really developed out of a research grant that I received from the Early American Industries Association back in uh, 1985. And it allowed me to do research at Old Sturbridge Village uh, to help move and recreate um, the Lyford Hutchins Cider Mill, which is at the, at the museum today. And that was uh, open uh, back in 1986. It was, uh, the reconstruction was, was finished and it was open to the public uh, in, in October of 1986. So while doing research for the subject of, of cider and cider making, I looked at hundreds and hundreds of documents and I continue to be interested in cider and cider making and pomology, the science of, of apples. So uh, I'm always taking uh, new pictures and, and looking into uh, new materials that, that I find about the subject. Something that a modern cider maker uh, told me fairly recently was that he's always looking for some new hook, some new approach for, for making cider from modern markets. And every time he thinks he's come up with something, gosh darn it, doesn't he find a historical reference for it? Because you know, distilled apple juice or, or fermented apple juice has been around for hundreds and hundreds of years. And you're going to have to go a really, really long way to figure out something that somebody in the oldie timey days didn't already think think about doing. But anyway, looking at fruit. Now, the first couple of pictures are are not uh, the the best, but they come from a series of what are referred to as genre paintings, or in this case, a, a watercolor that was done from real life during the period. And if we look at this particular picture, we can see. You know, there's some houses, uh, what, what look like buildings. And in the upper left-hand corner, there's this stand of trees. And something that was very significant for me is that these trees are not all lollipop trees that all look the same. They're all different. And that's a real indicator of an orchard because most orchards were not a monoculture. They were not all one kind of uh, apple tree or one variety of apple tree. So uh, having different shapes and different sizes um, is really an indication of a, a, a group of fruit trees. Uh, here's another uh, genre painting of about that si same time period, uh, more substantial buildings. And again, in the upper left-hand corner, we have uh, a group of trees behind what looks like a, looks like a barn. And in that case, they look a lot more similar 
But I love the fact that some of them are leaning one way or leaning the other. And that's the reality of, uh, of apple trees. If you go out and uh, drive around the countryside in our parts of New England, uh, you really will notice that the apple trees are, are not, again, like those, those popsicles or lollipop trees that uh, kids uh, tend to, to draw in, in elementary school. Well, here is a real apple orchard. This is actually uh, an apple orchard that exists at Old Surbridge Village to this day. And it's made up of a series of trees of different varieties from the early part of the 19th century, the late 18th century and the early 19th century. And you can see just by looking at this picture that there are different shapes, uh, different uh, types of uh, formations of the leaves, different heights. It looks very much like that genre painting from the uh, second decade of the, of the 19th century. Here's a, another view of it and a picture uh, on the left that I just took a couple of weeks ago of the fruit of a couple of those trees uh, that are there to this day. They're all pretty, pretty mature now. They've been there for a number of decades, so they're very, very well established. Something to keep in mind, speaking of established tree, that a standard apple tree that would have been grown in the 18th century uh, and pretty much uh, all of the 19th century uh, would not have reached maturity to the point where it would yield fruit in some cases till it was 12 years or older. So you're investing in an orchard that uh, is not gonna yield you any fruit or yield you any cider or applesauce or anything else for quite a number of years. It's an investment uh, in, in time and in labor that is not like rye or, or corn uh, or, or wheat or potatoes or any of those other crops. It's something that you really have to care for and manage for, for quite a number of years before you see any yield at all. Also, we talk about the different varieties of apples. When uh, the Mass Ag Society first did their survey of fruits in Massachusetts in the late 1830s, they found that there were over 3,000 varieties of apples just in Massachusetts. Now today, even if you go to a very well-established orchard, you're gonna be lucky if you find maybe 12 varieties. I don't know too many people that can name over 100 varieties, but back uh, in that early part of the 19th century, they were uh, specifically delineating over 3,000 distinct varieties of apples. And something that is unique to apples and a few, a few other uh, types of uh, agricultural crops, but definitely apples, is if you have a, um, oh, a Macintosh, to use a more modern variety. If you have a Macintosh, since that was a big favorite here in New England, and you cut it open and you see the seeds in the center, the little star pattern of seeds, and you plant those seeds, <clears throat> none of them will give you a Mac Macintosh. Some of them will uh, uh, be sterile and not produce any fruit at all. And the others that produce fruit will produce fruit, nothing like the parent fruit, because apples are very um, diverse. They're very complex genetically. And since the pollen of all the varieties of trees in an orchard is spread through the, the winds, through all the other varieties in the orchard, the seeds that are produced by the fertilized blossoms on one tree is not like that tree uh, when they mature. So the only way to get a named variety of fruit is by ingrafting or grafting. And here I have pictured two examples of grafting tools from who knows when, could be the 1700s, could be the 1800s, um, could be the early 20th century. I say you don't know when because these are hand forged. Uh, they're actually made, they're both made from old files. So there's something that a blacksmith would make uh, using um, reclaimed uh, uh, materials that had been worn out. And when you uh, look at these, you can actually see the clues of the hand welding and so forth that, uh, that went into them. So I know that they're a handmade product. Very similar tools are used today, but of course they're not, they're not made in, in this type of uh, uh, operation. They're, they're manufactured today and they're much, much more uh, consistent than what these are. These are consistent to a pattern because the tool is used in 
a particular way. And if we look at the picture on the right, what you'll see is that the metal has been drawn down into a very sharp blade. It's like a knife blade. And on the right, you'll see that we have the hook, the 90 degree angle at the other end of the tool. And those are brought down. So they're like a chisel point or really like a screwdriver. They're not as sharp as a, uh, as a, a chisel, but they're more like a screwdriver blade. So what you would do if you wanted a particular variety, one of those 3,000 uh, types of apples, is you would go to that apple tree and using the knife side of the tool, you would snip off a twig. You would then bring it to a tree in your orchard, snip off a twig from your tree, use the knife uh, blade to split that twig apart, make a V opening, use the screwdriver part to twist it and keep it open while you inserted that piece that you took from the known variety of tree. You then use a, some linen thread to tie it all up and the sap from your rootstock, from your uh, orchard tree will go up into the twig of the known variety and that known variety will then grow and you can cut off everything else on your tree and allow that uh, known variety to branch out. And that is what ingrafting or grafting does. And that's the only way uh, to get a particular type that, that you like the characteristics of. Something that would be sweet as a uh, table apple, as they call them, or something that uh, you would make applesauce on, or something that would last a long time in a cellar, a winter apple, or something that could go into cider to give you the the alcohol content and the um, the textures and the color that you that you wanted in your cider. So here we have uh, examples of um, two trees, one from um, in Palmer and uh, one from Hardwick. Uh, these are very 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 old trees. The one on the left is actually growing in a gravel pit, and one of these days I expect uh, one of the heavy pieces of equipment to just push this tree over. It's very tall. It's like a size of an oak tree. Uh, you know, that's that's what standard apple trees would be. Uh, they would be as large as that. Um, but it is uh, probably uh, one of the varieties of what's referred to as a transparent apple, which was a, a table variety of apple. And the ones on the uh, on the right uh, look uh, like a, a Spencer, which is a, a variety that that we see we see today. But both apples uh, are still around growing in the wild. Uh, there are people like myself that will go out and, and actually seek these kind of trees out and, and give them a taste. Uh, and there are people that still are taking uh, graft snippings from trees and bringing them back to their orchards so they can bring some of these heirloom varieties uh, back. Here's some that, that I just picked one day, um, several different varieties and you see different shapes and different colors. Something uh, to consider is that when the Pilgrim fathers and mothers came here in the 17th century. When you said apple to them, what they in their mind's eye would picture would be an elongated yellow fruit. And when you said pear, they would, uh, in their mind's eye, conjure a picture of a round red fruit. So what we think today is an apple should look like and what a pear should look like was actually opposite uh, if you go back far enough in history. So people's perception is, uh, is different. Uh, here's, uh, you know, a, a 19th century variety of pear uh, and an apple. And uh, that's my hand there on the left. That's an um, apple that I picked off an old tree up in the Berkshires uh, uh, last Saturday when I was on a hike up there. And actually very tasty, a very sweet apple. It does have a few spots from, uh, from insects, but uh, still a very uh, credible apple when it, when it comes to uh, an, an eating apple. Uh, and here are a few varieties that were exhibited at the uh, Covington Fair uh, in Massachusetts. Here we have the Rhode Island Green Inn, even though right here you see it's green ing. Um, I'll get back to that story in a minute. The Northern Spy and the Spitzenberg. Now the Rhode Island Green Inn has a, an interesting history. It actually was a 
fruit tree that was planted in front of, in front of a tavern in Rhode Island that was owned by Mr. Green, and it was the Green Inn. And people, uh, when they arrived on a stagecoach or, or on their saddle horses, would pick an apple off the tree, and they always commented about how tasty the tree was. So it got to be a um, standard operating procedure, if you will, that when guests left the inn, they would take a snip of a branch of the of the tree in front of Mr. Green's inn. And so many cuttings were taken off that tree that the original tree died. So there are green inns around today, and they're all descendants of that a, a single tree that grew in Rhode Island in front of Mr. Green's tavern. Here's some more of the Cox Orange Pippin, which is a great uh, table apple, uh, fairly big size fruit. Uh, it does have a, an orangey, uh, not a, a red color to it. And Pippin is a subcategory of, uh, of apples. Uh, you'll, you'll see a number of those around. Uh, another subcategory of uh, apples that you see are russets. And the ones on the right are Roxbury russets, which were actually developed in Roxbury, Massachusetts. The Baldwin apple was developed in, uh, in Massachusetts. There's a number of varieties that originally uh, were either discovered or, uh, or hybridized or, or um, uh, selected uh, here in Massachusetts and then became quite popular. Um, back when I was young, you used to hear an awful lot about the apples that were going to be used for cider were the drops. And in the old days, you never, ever wanted to use drops. And I'm going to share another quote with you here. Again, hearkening back to something that was mentioned in the introduction. And this comes from a book called The Distiller, written by Harrison Hall uh, back in 1818, published in Philadelphia. The process of making cider is so simple. However, this very simplicity and general knowledge of operation tends to ruin three-fourths of the cider that is made. And one of the things that could ruin a cider was using apples that had fallen on the ground or apples that had blemishes. Because as soon as the fruit uh, fell on the ground or had any kind of damage and oxygen got into the, the fruit, it starts to oxidize. And that will change the color and change the flavor of the cider that you, that you got get out of it. What you should do is you should collect your apples in barrels and in baskets, and you should bring them down to the mill. And at the mill, they should be stored above ground. And if possible, they should be covered with a tarpaulin or some other uh, material to keep them from uh, damage from birds or, or any other um, animals or, or any limbs or anything like that, that that might be blowing around. So you want the fruit to be as clean and as wholesome as an apple you would eat. If you wouldn't eat the apple, you shouldn't make cider out of it. Now, these are cider mills that still exist today. And most cider mills in the 19th century would be about 22 by 24 or 22 by 22 or 24 by 30. They're very often not quite square. They're barely rectangular but they are pretty good size. The cider mills that you would expect in Shrewsbury and in any town in New England, and you can go to the survey of manufacturers uh, to actually see how many cider mills you had. Um, they generally would be located uh, on a farm that had enough money to invest in the building and invest in the equipment. And they definitely were not your grandfather's cider press. You go to all the fall festivals today, <laughs> Excuse me. And what you'll see are these kinds of cider presses. This particular one is at the Enfield Historical Society in Connecticut. Um, and it's a particular patent that was that was made down there in the in the Thompsonville section of town. But <clears throat> this was really something that showed up in the latter part of the 19th century in the early 20th century for gentlemen farmers for the small farms that just have a few trees. Historically, most communities would have four or five cider mills. And just like people would bring their grain to a grist mill, 
to be ground and made into flour and and meal, you would bring your apples to a cider mill where they'd be processed into cider. So it's not something that that people did at home. It's not something that they did individually. (coughs) In the mill, you would have uh, some kind of crushing device. And uh, these are pictures of the restored uh, Lyford Hutchins Mill at Old Servage Village. And in the center lower section, you can see the frame that holds what are referred to as the nuts. Those are the crushing part of the of the operation. And you will see that long sweep that hangs down to your right. You attach a horse to the sweep, and then it's barely visible there, but there actually is a stick that comes out of the sweep, and you hang an apple there. So like putting a carrot before the horse, well, in a cider mill, you put an apple before the horse, and the apple will walk the apple. Uh, the apple will cause the horse to walk around in a circle of that sweep and turn the gears that are inside the crusher. So here we have that shaft that comes down with the gear teeth down below, and the gear teeth will turn two cylinders. One has pockets in it, and one has projections, uh, and those projections fit inside the pocket. So here you can see the projection um, and opposite it will be the pockets, the projections again here, and then the pockets. And those two cylinders, those two nuts can be uh, moved inward or outward to change the distance between the nuts. And uh, there were people that were uh, tight nut advocates and loose nut advocates. Some people said you should run those um, gears and run those nuts so close together that you actually break the seeds inside the apples. Most people said <coughs> you really didn't need to, to run them that, that close to get uh, the yield of cider you want. So as the cylinders turn, they rotate together. And what they produce here is what's called pumice. What falls into the trough in the bottom is the crushed apples and in the trade that's referred to as pumice. Now, uh, if you're making apple juice today, this has to be uh, pressed immediately. Historically, this would be left for anywhere between four and 24 hours to mellow. Uh, You wanna allow the apples to interact with the air so that the cell walls start to break down. They didn't think of it that way, but they, they knew that they would change color and it develops the sugars. Uh, the oxygen reacts uh, with the, the starches and so, so forth in the apples, and it helps to, uh, to raise the sugar level. <coughs> well, the apples are also uh, quite acid. So you never wanna use any kind of metal tool when you're uh, working with fruit like apples. So we, you would use wooden tools. We have wooden rakes and one, wooden shovels. Anything that comes in contact with the fruit has to be made out of wood. Now also stored in the cider mill for most of the year when the mill isn't being used. And the mill generally started to be used at the beginning um, of the season in the middle of September and would run up to, oh, I've seen some mills that ran till the very beginning of December, but usually by by November, your your apple crop is in. But you you would store straw in your mill. Now, this is straw, it's not hay. Most folks are not country bumpkins anymore, so they can't tell the difference. But in the old days, like when you were drilling uh, your troops during the Civil War and you had these illiterate farmers coming in, you could hot, you could tie uh, a piece of straw on one leg and a piece of hay on the other leg and teach them their right from their left by marching them hay foot, straw foot, hay foot, straw foot. They, that's how they learn their, their difference. But straw, is grown for the grain. If you think of rye and oats, they are grown for the seed pod on top and the stock of the plant is hollow, like a paper straw, or should we say the paper straw is like the natural straw, but animals will not eat this. It really has no food value. So it's used sometimes for bedding, but it's also used in cider making, which we'll see in a second. Also in the mill, uh, these are the original wooden frames Uh, that were used 
to help uh, corral, if you will, the straw. So what happens is you take a frame like this and you set it on the base of your press and you arrange all the straw parallel to itself inside of that frame. You then shovel with your wooden shovels the pumice onto the straw and then fold the straw back on itself so it creates a neat little package. Then you do a layer with the straw running in the other direction, same thing, back and forth, back and forth, till you've built up what's referred to as a cheese. And we're used to cheese only when it comes to dairy work. But the reason why a cheese in dairy work is a cheese is because you're pressing the curds. Well, in this case, we're pressing the pumice. It's all, it's agriculturally, it's all cheese. So that's actually a picture of me back in 1986 uh, when I was a much younger pup, uh, making up a, a cheese there uh, on opening day for the mill. So when you build all these layers up, you end up uh, seeing the straw with the pumice being contained within that straw. You then lay some boards on top and you start to bring down the screws. Now these are wooden screws, which was the common uh, type of screw that was used for most of New England. You see some iron screws in Rhode Island um, earlier on. You see them in New York, but um, for the most part, you see these are hand cut wooden screws. So they'd be laid out with a set of dividers and a string and then cut with a chisel. Uh, the, to create the threads and actually creating the beam that the screws go through is much more complicated than keeping than uh, producing the uh, the threaded parts uh, themselves, the press parts themselves. And here's uh, another shot of them. These are these are original to the mill. These are not reproductions, and they are lubricated with lard uh, to um, keep them so that they will uh, turn easily down to that uh, that beam, this, the uh, the beam of the press. And you use a, basically a limb, you use a, a stick to turn those screws down, which presses on the board on top of your cheese, and that forces the juice to run out. So what was the product uh, of the mills? Well, you can see here we have another cheese, a smaller cheese being pressed. And if you look closely in the picture where I've got that red arrow, you will see the fresh juice running out. This is what um, I was referring to earlier as what is called cider today, but historically, this is not cider. This is must, M-U-S-T. This is just the juice, um, and it really doesn't have much value uh, at this point. It's uh, just one step in the process of, of making cider. And the next thing you have to do <clears throat> is you have to transfer it into your barrels. And God forbid you don't use the proper barrel. Massachusetts, as well as a lot of the New England states, was very strict in this matter. And cider barrels were 32 gallons, standard size. And uh, if you were caught selling cider out of a barrel that was non-standard size, your barrel and its contents would be uh, confiscated and you would be fined uh, um, for, <coughs> for violating the law. And there were inspectors that went around uh, and would inspect barrels and brand them for size. So if you look at old barrels, or really old barrels, you'll sometimes see like JGB or something like that branded on it. And that's the inspector who has actually measured that the, the barrel does hold the, the contents that it should have. So a beer barrel, a cider barrel, a gunpowder barrel, a flour barrel, those all had standards by law. Sitting on top of the barrel there, it looks like a bucket. That is actually a funnel. And stuffed in the funnel is some more straw, and you would pour the must, you would pour, you'd pour the juice into that funnel, uh, into the barrel, and hopefully the straw would catch any other, um, oh, yellow jackets or anything like that that, that might have come along for the, for the ride. But um, once the barrel is full, then the magic happens. If you look at the center of the barrel, you'll see the bunghole. And your cider would be brought home and placed in your cellar. Most families would be producing uh, between 10 and 15 barrels of cider per year. So at 
you know, easy math, 32, you know, gallons per barrel, 10 gallons that, uh, or 10 barrels. Uh, that'll tell you how much <clears throat> the family had to deal with. But anyway, you have to watch the bunghole. And what will happen is that microorganisms called yeast, all those that had to make sourdough or want to make sourdough during uh, the COVID here, well, you were dealing with wild yeast as well. Yeast lives on the skin of the apples. And when it is crushed, <coughs> excuse me, and pressed, those yeast are rinsed off the skin of the apples. They flow with the juice and they flow into the barrel. And the yeast love to eat the sugars that are in there. That's why, again, it's important to wait for the, the sugars to develop to the mellowing of the fruit. And when the yeast eat the sugars, they produce two byproducts. One is carbon dioxide and the other is alcohol. So by watching the bung, you can watch how it fizzes. And depending how the fizzing is going, you can tell at what state that the fermentation is. What will happen is it'll just fizz like a soda, like soda pop or whatever. Uh, and then you'll start to see a brown scum that will form on the top as the fizz comes up. And then the brown foam of uh, fizz will turn lighter and you'll start to have a white foam that looks like shaving cream that will spread over the top of the barrel. It gets pushed out of the barrel. And when that dries, that hardens and it cracks and you start seeing brown spots on the, that white shaving cream, it's done. You put your bung in and because that means the yeast are dead. Uh, they've consumed as much alcohol as they can and the dead bodies are being pushed out of the yeast. So you can uh, put the, the, uh, the bung tight in there and you'll have cider that has, as I mentioned at the beginning, between four and 8% alcohol, depending on the yeast, the type of apples and the sugar and so forth that, that was naturally available. Nowadays, uh, you know, modern people use these airlocks to control any kind of microorganisms that might be uh, getting into the barrel. You know, as I said, they didn't do that. They watched that open bunghole to see what was going on. Um, this is a, a painting uh, that was done in the late 1860s uh, by Thomas Waterman Wood, um, New Cider. And you can see the, the older gentleman that has some experiences looking at the glass to seeing what, what color it is. He is passing on his knowledge to that uh, younger man in the background. And you can see the kind of press that uh, you just saw a actual antique of in that painting. Same, same type of press using the, uh, the same type of straw that we had. Uh, once you had those barrels sealed up, what happened to them? Well, they go into storage. Here we have a, a cider cellar. A lot of people think of cellars as being under houses, and some of them were, but many cellars were freestanding, much to the chagrin of people that believe in uh, you know, the Celtic settlers coming in here in 800 AD and building all these buildings. A lot of these things were really just built as potato cellars or cider cellars. So that's, that's from Antrim, New Hampshire, up in an area where I used to live. Here's one that is under a building. Uh, some buildings had uh, basements. Some people had cellars. This is actually a, a cellar because of the, the lay of the land, the hillside. Uh, you were able to get underneath the house with, uh, with a door that was big enough that you could roll a cider barrel into. Again, cider barrel, barrels are, are standard size. Once they're inside the cellar, uh, <coughs> they would be stored. Uh, Cellars were very often whitewashed. The lime uh, that makes up uh, the whitewash was thought of as a freshening because any kind of spillage that happened down here of your cider would sour and cause the, the cellar to um, get a distinctive smell to it. So by whitewashing, they did the same thing in dairies. Uh, it, it would help to, to freshen the room. Uh, here we have a, an example of more of the, the whitewash. This has got some cheese storage in it. Uh, once you have the cider, what do you do with it? Well, you drink it at every meal. This is the standard beverage that people had at every meal of the day. <coughs> you would send um, one of your sons down the cellar to draw off a, a pitcher uh, of cider from your barrel. 
But every time you draw off some of the cider, you allow air in. And when you allow air in, you're allowing other microorganisms besides the original uh, yeast in there. And what will happen is those microorganisms will start doing their work and they'll turn your cider into vinegar, which is a good thing. You, you know, vinegar is another product. You want that, but uh, you don't want all of your cider turning to vinegar. So what you have to do is you have to draw off the cider. So, so using a leather hose, you would uh, siphon off cider into junk bottles. And over in England, they made thousands and thousands and hundreds of thousands and thousands of uh, junk bottles. They're about a quart size. And the uh, um, liquid from the cider would be drawn off into uh, these bottles. And I've seen letters home from, from farmers that said, make sure to tell the hired man to draw the cider off. He should get about 200 uh, bottles. Because if you figure 32 gallons in a, in a barrel, and each one of these is about a quart. Again, you can do you can do the math and figure how many uh, bottles you, you get out of a barrel. And these are other examples of um, uh, junk bottles, cider bottles, stoneware jugs, redware jugs that, that can be used for drawing off. So cider was one of the products that you would get. Vinegar, as I mentioned, would be another product. And any cider that was left over from your meal would be dumped into a keeler which is a, a small open barrel in your kitchen that you keep by the fireplace. And that had the mother for the uh, vinegar in it. So any extra cider would be dumped in there and it would uh, <coughs> continue to, to work and, and turn into vinegar for you. But another product you could get from the mill would be to take that fresh apple juice, that must from the mill, put it in a cauldron and boil it down like you're making maple syrup. And what you end up with is maple molasses. And here we have maple molasses set into some uh, lard pots. They're only uh, glazed on the inside. These are redware pots. And this would be used as sweetening, just like molasses is used uh, as sweetening. And I won't go into all of the stories about this, but I will say that, of course, molasses is a, by is a byproduct of uh, cane sugar, cane sugar, came mostly from the British Caribbean, and it was uh, raised on plantations through slave labor. So a lot of New Englanders, you know, would much rather have the apple molasses that they could make themselves than to be using something that was produced with slave labor. <coughs> something else that you could do is once you press that cheese and you got all of the liquid out of it that you could, you would cut the cheese up mix it with water, repress it, and get a weaker version of the uh, cider called water cider. And people that were ailing or very young children were very often given water cider. Or you could chop up uh, the um, cheese. And actually, if you look, you can see some of the um, uh, apples uh, that have been pressed in the middle of the straw there. Anyway, you could chop that up and you could bring it back to your orchard and you could use it for fertilizer in your orchard, which some people uh, warned against doing because it also attracted rats and mice uh, that would love to eat the seeds. Or <coughs> you could dig a trench along your stone wall, throw this leftover cheese in that trench, and then wait for the trees that came from the seeds to spout, sprout in the springtime, weed out the weak ones. And after two or three years of the weeding out, you would end up with a row of strong apple trees that you could use for rootstock for engrafting. Remember, we talked about engrafting about a half an hour ago. So that that's how people would expand their orchard. Uh, so we, here we have the cheese all chopped up and uh, being brought away from the mill. And one of the people that was very interested in those cheeses that were chopped up and brought away from the mill was John Chapman. Uh, who was born in Lemonster, and um, his father went off during the Revolutionary War. His mother died. He and his sister uh, were uh, taken care of by an aunt till his father came home after the war. And then they moved to Longmeadow, Massachusetts. And uh, Johnny grew up uh, in Longmeadow, between a, became a Swedenborgian minister, and went out west as a missionary. And one of the things that he did 
is he purchased land on which he planted apple trees as a investment for people who were homesteading in the area. He would sell them the young trees because those uh, settlers would be able to gain their land to the Homestead Act sooner if they had fruit orchards than if they were just planting crops like corn and rye. <laughs> so he was a, a very astute individual, uh, much more learned than what we think of him today. Probably the worst thing that ever happened was that Walt Disney got a hold of John Chapman and made him kind of a, a goofy cartoon character. Uh, and he's a whole lecture just by himself to talk, talk about his, his whole religious missionary work and all that was, is very, very interesting. But Johnny Appleseed was a real person. He wasn't a myth. And he collected his seeds at cider mills. He rinsed out all the, the remains of the cheese in rivers and streams. And he would carry bags of apple seeds with him that he would then plant on this land for speculation. Well, all this unfortunately comes to an end uh, because of the temperance movement and the sun sets on the cider industry. The temperance movement originally very uh, legitimately was concerned about the amount of drunkenness and the about amount of liquor that was consumed in the early Republic in the United States. It was true. There was very, very vast quantities of liquor that was consumed by people. Drunkenness was not uncommon at all. And an early version of Mothers Against Drunk Driving was the temperance movement. And they originally went after um, distilled liquors like uh, like rum and whiskey and brandy. And when they gained success for that, they went after cider. And eventually they led to uh, the demise of cider and people looking for uh, alternatives. And you know, we had that quote at the beginning from uh, the uh, first decade of the 19th century. And here's a quote from uh, 1841 that says, now I see how much labor was worse than thrown away and making so much cider. We all thought that rum and cider were the necessities of life. To get into the cellar, 20 to 30 barrels of cider, and then how many miles travel up and down the cellar stairs to get it out. It was a waste of our time. Um, people started being attracted to the cities to go work in the mills. The farms were abandoned in New England. <coughs> the orchards went to rack and ruin, and um, they were not maintained. So trees uh, uh, fell into disuse. Uh, many of them died since they were not pruned or were not kept up and were damaged in ice storms and windstorms. And then the final death knell was under uh, our uh, president during the Depression uh, area. Uh, uh, Roosevelt and uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt uh, created all of these, as they call them, the alphabet soup uh, jobs, uh, the WPA and so forth. And one of the jobs he created under the agriculture department was to hire young men to go out and destroy all the old orchards because they were seen as hosts for webworms and other diseases that were spreading to commercial orchards. And that's why today we no longer have 3,000 or 3,000 plus varieties of apples uh, because all those old trees were cut and burned. Uh, any that were left a uh, hundred years ago or just about a hundred years ago uh, under the uh, the WPA and those other works uh, projects during um, the um, Roosevelt era in this country. So I'd like to thank you very much. I hope we've kept fairly close to the time. And uh, if there's any uh, questions that you might have, I'd be uh, happy to answer them. Um, but otherwise, I really do appreciate being able to come back and share a little bit of the history uh, of our area with you folks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dennis. That was that was excellent, excellent program. Uh, I like seeing all the, me the mechanics at Old Sturbridge Village. It's very, very good. Yeah, um, the machinery is pretty, it's pretty ingenious and you know, considering that it's all handmade and all laid out with a with a rule and a set of dividers, pretty uh, pretty good stuff. Worked pretty well. Yes, yes. Well, thank you very much. Our presentation next month, October twenty seventh, will be Doctor Edward Austin Flint.
Exposition of the American Revolutionary War by Donald Pottle. Thank you for watching our program tonight, and I hope to see you next month. Good night.